You do pray that God will richly bless us as we worship him as we gather around his table this night. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. We praise you, O God, for the son of your love. <laughs> name. We adore you with all of our hearts, you who are God, the sovereign creator and the redeemer of your people. You are the eternal, almighty, holy and righteous king of all the earth, ruling and ordering all things according to your wisdom, plan and purposes. We come before you remembering your word. My thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We come because in your goodness, mercy and love, you have revealed yourself to us. And by your grace, you have adopted us as your eternal children and graciously invited us even this night to your own table. Bless us and help us now truly to worship you in spirit and in truth. And in Christ's precious name we do pray. Amen. Praise my soul, the King of heaven.
we turn to our Old Testament reading and we once again read tonight Proverbs chapter 3, 1 to 11. We will read it responsibly. My son, daughter, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Find them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favour and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Nor your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honour the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, daughter, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him or her whom he loves as a father, the son and daughter in whom he delights. And we ask God to richly bless that leading to us. To his name we give all the praise and the glory. Amen. We come before God in our prayer of confession and supplication. Let us pray. Father, we praise you for the great God, the holy God, the righteous God that you are. And we have become aware of your goodness and holiness. But at the same time, we become aware of our sin, of our unrighteousness. We have broken your just laws and we've forgotten the vows of obedience to you. We have sinned grievously against you in thought, word and deed. We provoke your indignation and anger by our indifference to you and our rebellion against you. We come therefore not to claim that we are upright and worthy, but on the contrary, we come as sinners, sinners in need of forgiveness, who seek our justification and perfection through faith in your Son Jesus Christ and his blessed work of salvation. O God, look on us in mercy according to your gracious promises. Pardon all our sins, for we plead the merits of your Son, our Saviour, who suffered and died and rose again on the third day. Be to each one of us your own word of forgiveness and peace as we humbly bow before your holy presence, brought face to face with you, our God and Father, by your Son, who has opened up for us a new and living way into your presence. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our only Saviour and Mediator. We come, Lord, asking that you would bless us and help us truly to walk in your way, loving your word, knowing that in our own strength we can do nothing, but in your strength we are able to do all things. Sanctify us, Lord, in your word, help us to love your word and help us to live out our Christian life, remembering that we are known by the fruits of our spirit. Give us compassion for the lost. Help us to be there for the needy, for those who need encouragement, for those, O oh Lord, who have lost hope. Father, that we might present to them the living Lord Jesus Christ, who truly gives purpose for living and who will lead us, as we put our faith and trust in him, into your eternal kingdom. In his name we do pray. Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness.
turn to our gospel reading, Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they are neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they go. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I say to you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And uh, from our Bibles, 1 Peter, chapter 5, 5 to 11. Page one one eight nine. One Peter five five to eleven. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yet all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, passing all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walked about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same suffering, knowing that the same Sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Last time we had our first message on Proverbs chapter 3, looking at the first two of the five promises which the writer highlights um, in these verses. We looked at the promise of long life and the promise of prosperity, if we love and know the word of God, and secondly, the promise of a good reputation, if we follow what the Bible teaching, teaches in showing love and mercy. As I said then, I will say it again, there's no better place to stand than on God's promises as found in his word. As one writer puts it, you cannot starve a man who's feeding on the promises of God. The Bible is a book of wonderful promises. That is one reason why it is such a precious book. Its promises are not empty ones either. Every promise that God makes will hold good. They come with an ironclad guarantee, guaranteed not only for life but for eternity. And when you present those guarantees, 
they will always be honoured. We also pointed out that these promises are conditional. In other words, there is that if. Our gracious Lord loves us. He doesn't want us to act as robots or to receive the Lord's promises like robots. If we love Christ and we want more and more and more of him as we should, we will gladly serve him and we will gladly obey his word so that these conditions of the promises are fulfilled lovingly, cheerfully and obediently. And so we go on to our third promise in verses 5 to 6 of guidance and blessing. Now, these verses are well known and Christians quote them often. They are similar to the proverb in chapter 16, verse 3, which says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans will succeed. Now, we must never forget that these are proverbs and cannot bear the weight that perhaps we want them to bear. These proverbs do not say, trust in the Lord and not yourself, and everything will turn out just as you hope, without as much a hitch. We need to keep in mind everything else that Scripture tells us before we jump to such a conclusion. And, of course, this is the conclusion which the health and wealth gospel comes to every time. So what is the promise? The Romans back then were well known, among other things, for the building of roads. I don't know if you're aware, but Rome built some 50,000 miles, that's about 75,000 kilometres, of hard-surfaced highway, primarily, of course, for military use. Now, not all of these roads were completely straight, but most of them were. They are famous for their straightness. Now, there's nothing like a straight road. You can't get lost on a straight road. It's always easier to get along when there are no turns to negotiate, no dead-end streets, and no cross streets where you've got to make up your mind where you will go. Here the wonderful promise is, and he will make your paths straight. We could translate it as he will direct your paths. That, in fact, is the meaning. He will direct your paths. It's a promise of guidance, of entrance onto the narrow road that leads to life and of God's leading all the way to heaven. One of the beauties of the Christian life is that although it is not always easy, it's generally straightforward. As the Shorter Catechism reminds us, God has lovingly and graciously given us his word. And in his word there is everything we need to know about the Christian faith, about God, and every direction on how we are to live. Certainly there are difficult questions when it comes to guidance, but we are more often asking not for guidance, but for the Holy, for the Holy Spirit leads us, but for strength that we might do the right thing. So the promise here is that he will direct our paths. Now what's the condition? In the Hebrew, the little translation of verse 5 is, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and on your own understanding lean not. So this helps us to see the three parts of this condition. Firstly, there is the condition of faith. Those who want to be, who desire to be led in the right path, in the straight way, of course need to have that living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, to have a living faith in the one true God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. There must be faith. This is basic. In fact, it is the key to every promise. It is more than simply believing God's word. 
It is putting your trust in a person, in God himself. This is brought out time and time again in the New Testament. Trust is dependent on faith. If we have no faith, well, there is no trust. But having said that, we must also remember that faith is a gift from God, just as salvation is a gift from God, so is faith. And so our reliance in everything must always be upon our sovereign Lord, never, never upon ourselves. So often we claim to be seeking God's guidance when in fact we are trusting in our own abilities. In the New Testament, we see this stress that God is the sovereign Lord and all is dependent on him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Not work at your salvation or do this and this, but believe to have faith and you will be saved. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me, said Jesus. It is required that we do this in a sincere and wholehearted way with all your heart to truly love the Lord Jesus and to have faith, to have faith that in fact with God we are able to do the impossible. So first condition is a living relationship with Christ and that we have faith and that we trust in him, not lean on our own understanding. Secondly, correction. And lean not on your own understanding. Lean on Christ. Don't lean on yourself. Don't trust in your own understanding or your own abilities. By nature, we are darkened in our understanding and we are separated from the life of God. We are ignorant due to the hardening of our hearts as Ephesians 4.18 reminds us, pride, that self-centeredness, would have us believe that we are quite okay on our own. We don't need any direction. We can get there by ourselves. In a world where the emphasis is on fulfilling your dreams and to follow those dreams and that you will be able to fulfill those dreams where everything is made out that you are capable of doing anything and everything, as Christians we must resist the pull of the world in this area as in all other areas and continually lean upon Christ. We are to love him with the whole of our being, with the whole of our mind, soul and strength. Never lean on your own understanding, which really means Never, ever follow the ways of the world. Don't give in to peer pressure. Don't give in to what the media tells you. Thirdly, the condition of consistency. Firstly, to have faith. And um, secondly, um, to allow God to correct you, to pull you away from the ways of the world that you might truly follow his way. And thirdly, consistency in all your ways. Acknowledge him, not in one way or two ways or some ways, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Whether small or great, look to him in all your ways. Jesus did not, does not say that we must not serve God and mammon. He says we cannot serve God and mammon, and we must not. The idea of a compartmentalised life cannot work as far as the gospel is concerned. Too many so-called Christians compartmentalise the gospel. They are one thing here on Sunday, but when it comes to Monday, they are different. They simply become part of the world again. If you try to cultivate only part of your garden and leave the rest, the weeds will soon invade the part that you've set aside. And we've got to ask ourselves, is there a part in our lives that we're trying to keep for ourselves, that we're saying to God, hands off? Do we acknowledge him in all of our ways? 
Or are there certain ways, certain paths that we've digressed onto where he, we do not acknowledge him? Are you trying to be one thing on Sunday and another on Monday? And so what do we have? The promise is that the Lord will direct us and lead us along that straight path, a path that does not have detours and a path that does not have a dead end, a path for the Christian that leads to eternal life. What are the conditions that we walk faithfully with the Lord? Not just believing in him, although we must start there, but just as importantly, go on from there, exercising true faith, believing and knowing that his way is right. We must allow his word to correct us. We must be consistent. We are to acknowledge him in all of our ways. We are not to lean on our own understanding. Left to ourselves, we will go down those detours. Left to ourselves, we will end up in dead-end um, streets. Left to ourselves, we do not make the wisest choices in life. And it is these detours which bring pain and frustration to our lives. If the Lord would direct us, we will allow his word to guide us in living consistently, not being all holy on a Sunday here at church, but we will have the mind of Christ. Knowing God's word, knowing Christ, we will have the mind of Christ to direct us, to acknowledge him in all of our ways, not just now, but for every moment of every day. Left to ourselves, we will end up in dead-end streets. Our ways, the world's ways, offer nothing but believing, trusting, walking faithfully and consistently before our God. He will direct us. The way will be straight with no detours and no dead ends. And so we come to the fourth promise, the promise of health and strength. Now, what is the promise? In verse 8 we read, This will bring health to your body, and nourishment to your bones. As in verse 2, where the promise is for long life and prosperity, here we have another very concrete promise of health to your body. Literally, it means to your navel, continuing the life that was first given to you by your mother, and strength or marrow to your bones. We know how important the marrow in the bone is for health. If the marrow is affected by cancer, for example, and unless it is treated successfully, life will be drained out of the body. The gospel is good for body and soul. Godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. 1 Timothy 4.8. However, it is true that Christians become ill and die, although they may be full of faith and the Holy Spirit. So what is the deal here? The promise of health and strength. And yet we know that even Christians can die. What the promise is that every believer can know both great spiritual health in this life and resurrection to eternal life in the life to come. Now, we must stress again that living in a materialistic age, we can easily become um, slave to the interpretation that what is promised here is merely in a materialistic sense, that we are offered a perfect life, no colds, no flus, no cancer, a perfect body. But even though there are those who push this and preach this, especially televangelists, this is not what the writer of Proverbs is saying. This is not what is promised. And we must be very aware of that. If it were, then what do you say to people who fear the Lord, who shun evil, and yet still fall ill? Are they being hypocrites? Ah, this is the problem that another wisdom book 
the book of Job tackles head on. There's no question that Job feared God and shunned evil. The very first verse of the book says, In the land of Uz there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and he shunned evil. Nevertheless, he suffered appallingly. What we find in that book should warn us against taking a verse like this and assuming that it can be simply applied in a materialistic and universal sense. That was the great mistake of Job's so-called comforters. They said, oh, Job, you've really messed things up. You've really sinned against God. You've really done the wrong thing. That's why you're suffering. If you hadn't done those wrong things, everything would be perfect. You wouldn't be sick. You wouldn't have lost your children. You wouldn't have lost your possessions. If things were that simple, then no one would ever have doubts or perplexities. There are many reasons why God allows people to suffer. Sometimes it is because they fail to fear the Lord and they do not shun evil. At other times, even though they are truly godly, they still fall ill and die. In this life, we can never be sure exactly why a person is suffering, but we do know, for example, that God disciplines his children. And this very theme is taken up in this, in this same chapter of Proverbs from verse 11, which we'll deal with later. We also know from Job that God's outlook and purposes are higher than ours. And we need to recognise that there are many things about his rule over this world that we do not and cannot and will not understand in this life. But what we can say is this, that if we follow God's way, we will have rich spiritual blessings, not just for now, but for all eternity. So let's look at the condition, the ifs. The condition for this promise is found in the previous verse. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Again, we see here a threefold prescription. Humility, homage and holiness. Humility, homage and holiness. Firstly, humility. And we read about humility in our reading from 1 Peter 5. Do not be wise in your own eyes. That pride within us rises up so many times, doesn't it? We think we know best. We think we know it all. There's a sense in which the way to heaven is perhaps downward rather than upward. We've got to look at ourselves before looking up. We've got to empty ourselves of self. And we need to look up to be filled with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an acknowledgement that by ourselves we can do nothing. It is giving thanks that salvation is a free gift and that not of good works lest anyone should boast. It is praising God that in our weaknesses God's strength becomes clearly visible. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Without humility, we're not able to do that. When humility is lacking, the focus is on self, not upon God. Blessings can only come when, he, when we empty ourselves of self and allow Christ to fill us with his love. The second condition is homage, fear the Lord. And we will keep coming back to this theme of reverence. This is where wisdom begins. It is what Calvin called the root and origin of righteousness and what Professor John Murray called the soul of piety. American preacher Al Martin once identified its three essential ingredients as follows. Homage, worshipping God, fearing the Lord. We need a correct concept of the character of God. God is exactly who the Bible says he is. 
And if we play around with that, we are in trouble. Uh, secondly, we need a pervasive sense of the presence of God, that we're never on our own. He is always present. He has given us his Holy Spirit to dwell in us, that he is always there. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And thirdly, to truly fear the Lord, we need a constant awareness of our obligation to God. We must always obey him. Now, let's remember that when I talk about obedience or that when we talk about obedience, we are not talking about a legalistic approach to um, knowing God. When we talk about obedience for the Christian, we're talking about our love for God and how will we show our love for God. We will show our love for God by knowing God's word and by obeying God's word. It is only then that we will be able to show the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. A child cannot be blessed if he does not recognise who his parents are. And if that child does not obey them in Christ. And so it is with us. We will never know God's blessings in this life and in the life to come if we do not recognise his holiness, his omni or all presence, his presence everywhere at all times. And if we do not respond to his love for us in Christ by gladly and willingly obeying his word. And the third if, third condition, holiness and shun evil. These three ideas follow fast on the heels of one another. True humility leads us to the fear of God. And true fear leads to a turning away from every evil. The Amish people, I hope you know who they are. They are people who desire to stay true to God. They often reject many of the modern um, innovations, such as TV, etc. But they're fantastic farmers, they're fantastic homekeepers, and also often great parents. But the Amish people and other similar groups practice what they call shunning. Now, this can be very legalistic at times, it can be very cruel, but this shunning is a means of dealing with backsliders and apostates, those who leave the faith. If such a group shuns you, they will not so much as speak to you. Now, whatever we may think of such a practice, we must certainly learn to shun all that is evil with great vigour. Holiness, or rather lack of it, is the number one problem in the church today. The church in its teaching often conveys the message of cheap grace, and several books have been written with that title, Cheap Grace. Cheap grace is simply claiming what God gives to us in Christ and then living as we please. Well, of course, the two don't go together. Cheap grace, there's no call to commitment. There's no call to overcoming evil. There's no call to live righteously before our almighty God. Sin is not preached against. The Ten Commandments are mothballed. Holiness is the last form of spiritual discipline. And the church, of course, is the poorer for it. Blessings do not abound, as Christians in the church lurch here and there, having no sure foundation. If we would know life and healing, blessings in this life and blessings in the next, we had to humble ourselves to acknowledge God for who he is, and in his strength and by his grace, live a holy life to his glory. God gives grace to the humble. To those who humbly trust him with all their heart, he gives the grace of God. To those who humbly refuse to be wise in their own eyes, he gives the grace of spiritual health and strength. He gives that peace which the world cannot give. To those who humble themselves under his hand, he will give the grace of exaltation. And to those who humbly cast their cares on him, 
He gives the grace of caring, carrying their cares. And so it is good for us to be familiar with these verses. Seven to eight of Proverbs, as of course with verses five to six. There are times we must remember to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And there are other times we must remember not to be wise in our own eyes. They are related, they are complementary, yet different. But both remind us that cultivating humility before God is among the healthiest things that we can do for our souls. Let us pray. Oh, Father, we just thank you again for your promises. We thank you that you show us the way through your word. We thank you that we can humbly come before you and trust in you to lead us on that straight path. Forgive us when we allow the self to rule. Forgive us when we do not acknowledge you as the sovereign Lord. Father, we thank you that as we put our trust in you, as we humble ourselves, as we shun evil, that your blessings will abound, not just in this life, but in the life to come. We know that Satan comes, and like with Eve, he says, has God really said this? Yes, Lord, you have said it. And help us not just to put on a good, um, a good faith and, a, and, uh, and good actions on a Sunday, but, Lord, help us to truly love you and to live out what it means to be a Christian in our daily lives, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Lord, undertake for us. And we thank you for the, your promises. Help us truly to believe, to have faith, that with you all things are possible. And we pray this in Jesus' name. We'll sing our communion hymn. No, sorry. Here now, O oh Lord, I see you face to face. presentation of the gospel. The gospel, I guess, is summed up in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have 
everlasting life. Here we have that invisible form, the broken bread, representing the broken body of Christ, his suffering, as that whip ripped open his flesh and as those nails pierced his hands. And in the fruit juice, we have the emblem of his blood, his blood freely shed for us, paying the penalty for our sins. And from the word of God, we have the institution of this sacrament. All rites, tradition which I have passed on to you goes right back to our Lord. And that tradition tells that on the night on which he was being delivered into the hands of his enemies, the Lord Jesus took a loaf. And when he had thanked God for it, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. You must continue to do this to make you remember me. In the same way, at the end of the meal, he took the cup also and said, this cup stands for the new relationship with God made possible at the cost of my death. You must continue to do this as often as you drink it to make you remember me. For every time you eat this loaf and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Paul also reminds us that we should not come to this table unless we truly have that living and dynamic relationship with him, that we have confessed our sins and also that we've forgiven those around us. But the invitation is there that those who truly love the Lord to come and join with us as we celebrate um, this communion. And as the Lord Jesus gave thanks, we too now give thanks. Father, we praise and thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Truly you are holy and righteous God. Truly you are worthy to be worshipped. We thank you that the um, Lord, you have redeemed us. You have paid the penalty. We thank you for, these, um, for this visible presentation of the gospel, for your suffering, for your shed blood. You have died in our place and risen again so that we too can share in that victory, victory over sin and death. And Lord, we just pray that we will not just simply take this for granted, but that our heart will be for you, loving you with the whole of our being and living out that love in willing, obedient and sacrificial service, giving our all to you, even as you have given your all to us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And as according to the institution, command, an example of our Lord Jesus Christ, I take this bread and having given thanks, break it and give it to you. Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me.
spoken for you, this do in the remembrance of me. According to institution, command and example of our Lord Jesus Christ, I take this cup and give it to you. This cup is the New Testament in the blood of Christ, which is shed for the remission of the sins of many. Drink all of it. sit again at your table. We thank you too for those who once sat here and now sit at your table in the home of many mansions. We thank you that they await our coming. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit. Preserve us from the clever schemes of the evil one. Keep us faithful, reminding us what it means to be a Christian. For those of us who, be, who are members of the vows that we made when we became members of your church, and mercifully grant that when for us the busy fever of this life is forever hushed, our joys here are ended, and our work on earth is completed, we may have perfect communion with you in that kingdom where all the redeemed of the Lord are forevermore. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we sing our last two verses of our communion hymn, um, you'll be waited upon for your free will offering. And I'll ask Isaiah perhaps to take up the offering. <coughs>
just thank you for your many blessings. Truly, you are a gracious God who gives abundantly. And Father, forgive us that we're not thankful enough for all that you do for us, especially in giving us your Son to suffer and to die. Receive these our gifts and with them our souls. Almighty God, we pray for your church upon earth. We pray for the fellowship of all believers and that your word may truly be preached, the sacraments rightly administered, and this discipline uprightly maintained. We pray for our country, for our sovereign king, and for all who are in a position of authority in this land. We pray, Father, for the uh, parliament, for the senate. We pray for all judges and magistrates, for all leaders in the various fields of agriculture and commerce. We pray, Father, that your blessing uh, would rest upon those who are called um, to serve our country in, in the military, air force and navy. And we pray for all nations, for our brethren in the Commonwealth, give to those who are afflicted by any kind of cross, such as war, plague, poverty, persecution or disaster, give to them patience, faith and endurance. And we pray that we might do everything to show the love of Christ in their need. Remember before your throne of grace our families and our friends. Grant that we may be united in our faith in you and in our love for each other. We remember before you those who suffer in body, mind or estate. Restore health according to your will to our sick. Give peace to the wounded mind and bind up the broken in heart. And we again remember this night, um, Lynn, and ask that your healing hand would be upon her, but above all, that she would know your grace and your peace, and that you will never leave her nor forsake her. We pray for others who are not well, um, Lord, who are not able to come to worship today because of sickness, grant healing to them also. We pray for those who do not know you. And we pray for those who have wandered from your church. We pray for those who become um, captives to error, who have turned to cults and false religions. We ask, Father, that you'll turn them away from here from, and bring them back from darkness to light. Bring them back to the Lord Jesus, that they, with all your faithful people, may worship and serve you, our God and Saviour. We offer our prayers of intercession, trusting in the all-sufficient merit of your Son, our only Saviour and Mediator. Amen. My faith looks up to thee, the Lamb of Calvary. <coughs> Oh, 
peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.